my son was almost six months old and all of a sudden he started doing something that was very odd. Now, he was my third child. You kind of instinctively know within yourself sometimes when something is wrong, and I would say to any parent, listen to your inner self. He started doing something that looked like a hiccup. But when a child hiccups, especially an infant, there's a tendency for this little spot in here to like go in. That wasn't happening. And there was no <laughs> sound. And I thought, I wonder if, if he's having a seizure and it would happen when he woke up from nap. So I took him to more than one pediatrician on St. Thomas and all of them kept saying there's nothing wrong. They did all his neurologicals. They all came out normal, but there was something different about my son. And so I insisted that there was something different and they sent me to see a pediatrician in Puerto Rico and the pediatrician in Puerto Rico said, um, no, his neurological, Tests are coming out fine. I don't think he's having seizures. Uh, maybe he's having breath holding spells, or maybe he has a calcium deficiency. So I wasn't convinced that that was, that either of those were the answer. And so we took him to Children's Hospital in Washington, D.C. And there they did a battery of tests, and they said, oh, what he has is infantile spasms. And so he just needs shots of ACTH. It's something that he can outgrow. Since you're a nurse, you can give him the shots. This is perfect. Then we got to the hospital the morning. And as we're going, approaching the elevator, here comes one of the doctors that we had met and had worked with our son. And he said, I hope you had a good night's rest. And my husband says to me when we were in the elevator, I don't like the sound of that. And we got into the um, room, into Lee's room, and then all of a sudden, all these people started coming into the room. And we knew, I knew then, he knew before, but I knew then, this is not good news. And now they'd gotten the results of the MRI, and it's worst case scenario, your son has lysencephaly, he has a smooth brain, he doesn't have the capacity to learn, and he's probably not going to live a very long life. People say, you know, don't give your baby too much hand. You know, too much hand's going to spoil the baby. But an infant, you can't give too much hand to an infant. Um, they, they aren't um, thinking about how to get back at you or how to be, um, be controlling. An infant needs hand. And, um, and, the, and touch and interaction and that warm nurturance, that is really what grows a baby's brain. And that really is what creates that bond between the parent and the child, whether it's a father, mother, or a grandmother, whoever's taking care of the child. In terms of looking at your child and seeing where they fit, um, today we have so much more available to us than we had before, you can Google. If your child is two months old and you have a feeling, a gnawing feeling that something is different, look up developmental milestones. What should my child be able to do between zero months and three months? Should he be able to lift his head up and hold it on his own? Should he be able to follow an object, anticipate a bottle? What, what are the things that he should be able to do? And then look at your son objectively or your daughter and say, my son or daughter can't do that. I have this feeling that something is wrong and these are things that he or she should be doing that they're not doing and then the, the fastest you can get help. Sometimes, you know, parents will say, oh, well, my, my sister didn't walk till she was two and she's okay, or my husband didn't talk until he was three and he turned out okay. And I think that a lot of times um, parents will, will have that kind of reaction. And so there are lots of times people will be a self-blame or, or angry at, at the system, you know, why didn't my doctor do this? Or, you know, maybe this happened at the hospital. And uh, my reaction to parents when they say that is, that may be true, but we don't know what's going to happen in the future. Let's try to make sure that we catch it early and get some extra help just in case that's not the tra trajectory of your child. Accept that if your child has something that makes them a little bit different, um, the quicker you are able to get help, the quicker the, there's intervention, the better the result will be. And there are feelings of guilt that come with that. 
Oh, when I was pregnant, did I drink too much coffee? Maybe I should have quit morphine when I was at eight months. Um, or was it that drink I had during carnival? Um, there's so many things that, that, there's so many emotions going on, but fight the urge to fight the guilt and fight. First and foremost, that individual is a child and has similar needs, similar um, for, for love, nurturing, attention, for positive interactions, for joyful experiences, all those same needs that any child has, the child with a disability has. The zero to three program or the infant and toddler program is um, administered under the Department of Health and it is for children with disabilities but also children with developmental delays. It's also for children that have a high risk for developmental delays. So for example, they, they will meet with every parent who has a child that is premature. In, in the infants and toddlers program, parents and, will participate in what's called designing their individualized family service plan, or IFSP. For children ages 3 to 21, they get an IEP, or Individualized Education Plan. So the focus for birth to three is really on the child and the family, and in providing the family with assistance in how they can help their child develop and, and succeed and, and, imp and improve whereas the parent is, is less the focus once the child turns three as in the Department of Education. You are not your, your child's best advocate at that moment because you're dealing with your own emotion and then you're sitting there and then you have all these professionals sitting around you and they're dissecting your child and they're talking about where they are in terms of speech, where they are in terms of physical therapy, where they are in terms of this, where they are in terms of that. They're throwing terms to you like IEP, least restrictive environment. So you ask me, do you understand? And I go like the little doggy on the windshield and I go, uh-huh, uh-huh, and you don't understand a word. First of all, because you're so emotionally stressed out. Secondly, you're throwing things at me that I don't even know what they mean. And thirdly, I don't know that I want to tell you that I don't get it. Sign on the dotted line and walk away, and then two weeks later, they're all bent out of shape because, well, that's not what I want. Well, you don't, you, you signed the paper, you said you agreed. So it's important that someone who knows the system um, and who can represent for you to be there, particularly with that very first, that initial IEP. When professionals start using what I call alphabet soup, and they start throwing out the IDEA and IFSP and, and you know and, and IEP and all these, that's a real advocacy moment for parents to be able to say, wait a minute, what is that? What does that mean? I think it's to stop professionals, and, and I think most professionals try to um, explain or say it out, but we get we as on all professionals, we get entire professional jargon and I think it's just really important for parents to say listen I'm not a special special educator so please describe what that is accept yourself as an expert on your own child that in and of itself is very empowering so that when you walk into a room and to do an IEP with all these people these professional people um, that you see yourself as an equal partner there. Your voice needs to be heard. There's a requirement that the plan be reviewed annually, but it does not mean that you have to wait till the annual review to, to express concerns. The, uh, the team meeting can be called by anyone. The parent can call the, the whether it's Department of Ed or Department of Health um, to their, their program to their, and, and mention it to their um, who's ever providing the services, I want this to be changed. The more you know the rights of your child, the more you can advocate for your child. But you can't learn it all. And as things come up, you need resources and to be able to advocate best for your child. So you need to become very familiar and have on speed dial um, people like, like the, the Disabilities Rights Center. Learning to use your, your 
computer to, the, to, to access information readily. I, I think it's important for parents to know about their rights when it comes to all acts that refer to people with disabilities or developmental delays. And, and those, those include the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which really focuses on education from birth to 21, which is what infants and toddlers and special ed fit under, um, 504, which some special ed students fit under, and the Americans with Disabilities Act. I think it's really important for parents to be familiar with these so that they know what their rights are, what, what rights their child will have as they grow. And there are many different sources online that have it written in parent-friendly, family-friendly language. There's a team of professional people, including myself, as a special instructor, as well as specialized providers such as audiologists, speech therapists, physical therapists. These are all special service providers that work as a team and work with a particular child depending on what his need is. It is important that we see the, the, the whole child, the whole person. And if we see the whole person, then we'll recognize that being with other people is important. Just because I have um, one leg, if, we, if, we, if you were typical and lost a leg, all of a sudden you wouldn't only be dealing with one-legged people. The more comfortable the parent is for bringing their child out, the more comfortable the child becomes and the more accepting other people become. Um, I think that people will be curious, they may ask questions, and um, I think that it's more curiosity than it, and I think, you know, it's helpful for parents to understand that. Respite care for me was simply having um, a relative just come over and give me a break. You're, you're gonna need somebody for support. Recognize that it may be your mom but she can't handle it right now. Or maybe your mom can handle it and you can't handle it right now. Or, you know, there are different combinations of, of, of um, family structures and support systems. And not everybody is on board at the same time. And we need to learn to accept that and be forgiving because it is not what you expected. And in every, everything that is unexpected, sometimes people are able to handle it and some people aren't.